Alleluia. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to John. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. On the night of his arrest, Jesus taught his disciples about the relationship they would have with him. Those who abide in his word and love bear fruit, for apart from him, they can do nothing. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you, just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. It's not going to happen to me. Those of us who were around in the 90s remember this HIV awareness ad, which for some reason I just can't find in the YouTube archive of public service ads because YouTube always seems to have everything, but not this. But obviously, it made a pretty huge impression on me if I can still remember it, and I can, vividly. The ad shuffled through various faces, people of different ages and genders and ethnicities all saying, It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen to me. And finally settling in on one woman who said, it happened to me. And then the PSA went on to talk about how important it is to get tested and how even though we might feel we're invincible, this virus didn't care whether we thought we were tough or not vulnerable. This virus could get to us any number of ways. That line of thought, it's not going to happen to me, is pervasive. At its heart, it's a psychological defense mechanism. If I can figure out why I'm going to be protected from something terrible, whether it's cancer, climate change, gun violence, police violence, COVID, or medical bankruptcy, I don't have to think too hard about it. It stops being my problem. If I don't go to K-12 schools, I don't have to worry about getting shot at school. If I'm white, I generally don't have to worry about police violence. If I'm older, climate change isn't my generation's problem. If I think I'm not in a vulnerable group, COVID's not going to hit me hard, and on. But even though this psychological defense mechanism is something we all do, and even though it's helpful for short-term self-preservation, it necessitates a lack of empathy. It's the root of our inability to change the system if things are working well enough for us at any given point in time. And our inability to change is rooted in that sense of self-preservation that keeps us from imagining what it must be like to suffer. It keeps us from being compassionate, from feeling with our neighbors, from understanding their pain. Love is at the heart of empathy. Paul writes, if we cannot love our sibling whom we have seen, how can we love God whom we have not seen? And perfect love casts out fear. God, our comforter, calls us into the uncomfortable so that abundant life will be possible for all. Our inability to empathize comes from the fear of what will happen if we step out into the unknown. God is calling us to do a little exposure therapy and get ourselves used to the idea that not everything will be cozy. Justice doesn't look the way we think it looks all of the time. Good enough isn't really good enough. When a 16-year-old girl is gunned down by police minutes after the first ever conviction in Minnesota of a white police officer who killed a black man, God calls us to get uncomfortable. When kindergartners have to do active shooter drills, hiding in closets and under desks, 
while a man who has been identified as a risk, who should have been barred from purchasing any weapons, can go buy a gun days before shooting up a FedEx warehouse. God calls us to get uncomfortable. When because the pandemic caused us to stop, we now have evidence that driving and flying less causes pollution levels to plummet, God calls us to get uncomfortable. And when our hospitals are full of COVID patients, even though we are exhausted and tired and we don't want to do any more, God calls us to get uncomfortable. Loving our neighbor means we break down our walls of protection and admit that bad things can happen to us, that even if it doesn't happen to us, we care. We step out of short-term self-preservation and into empathy. Jesus calls us to abide in a life of love, a life in which we strive to become ever more fully human, to care deeply for the needs of all our neighbors, those whom we know, those we'll never meet, and even those who are not yet born. And when we abide in love, we abide in God, and God abides in us. It is not merely enough for us to be, us to be guests in this love. God calls us to abide, to live, to reside in it, for this love to permeate our being and to be the ground of all we are and all we do. When we abide in God's love, we look to our siblings, recognize their suffering, and we respond in love, not just in sympathy, but in empathy and compassion, allowing ourselves to become vulnerable enough to feel with. Abiding in God's love means breaking down the walls that keep us mentally and emotionally closed off. The walls we think keep us safe. Jesus, always and ever, calls us outward into the world, abiding in and living the embodiment of God's expansive love. Amen.